I'm um, going to get us started by uh, introducing our, our next speaker, um, Veronica Moore. She is uh, Patient Advisory and Insight Lead at IQVIA. And for those of you not familiar with this sort of unpronounceable series of capital letters, um, IQVIA was formed, this is the official statement, IQVIA was formed through the merger of two industry leaders, IMS Health and Quintiles, which anyone who has been in the industry will recognize they were indeed giants in the field. The result, of course, is an organization that really is a giant. And uh, they have approximately 55,000 employees worldwide, and they are truly a world leader in the area of um, clinical trial management and clinical data management. As a result, we, of course, are standing on the shoulders of giants as uh, she takes the podium. Um, Veronica is a patient-centric leader with over a decade of experience working in various roles such as rare diseases, clinical research management, project management, patient engagement, education activities, clinical trial study design. She's currently responsible for clinical trial awareness and education, developing long-term relationships with patient advocacy groups like ourselves, and uh, managing patient engagement strategies for clinical trials. And I think you're going to be uh, the object of one of those strategies in just, just a few minutes. She's got a degree in public health and a master's in sociology. And uh, she will be leading this next session on how clinical trials work. And most importantly, how we can learn more about them and what's involved in getting involved with them. Great, thank you so much, Andrew, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to come and participate in this phenomenal uh, conference. And I call it a family day meeting as well because we're all family and working together to drive research for it for an important cause. So today I want to talk about participating in a clinical trial and what does it mean to participate in a clinical trial as well. So today during this presentation, we will talk about the following topics. I am from North Carolina, so please excuse the southern twang to my voice. <laughs> so what is a clinical trial? We're gonna talk about that. What is a clinical trial volunteer? Um, it sometimes it's referred to as a research participant. And what are the phases of clinical trials as well? We will talk about that. And more importantly, we will talk about what is informed consent? What does that mean for you? And what are your rights as a research participant? And lastly, but most importantly, how do I find out about these awesome clinical trials that are taking place in this space of hypersomnia? So from the beginning, we'll talk about what is clinical trials, and that involves using a human, or I like to say an individual, um, call a participant that is intended to um, add medical knowledge to the research. So you know that in the early stages, we have you know, mouse models, we have some of our longitudinal observational um, data that we collect, but when we get to the point of driving the research forward where we want to introduce a potential compound or a drug to a participant, that is when we actually need the participation of patients and individuals individuals like yourselves. And then jumping along to the next item, human subjects are individuals, as you can see, who participate in, in, in research. And those can be actually human, healthy individuals, or individuals affected or impacted by a disease or condition. So here's the interactive session. I'm the young whippersnapper of the group <laughs> at my company, and I always like to make things interactive. So you'll see on your table, and you can share with your neighbor if you want to make this a little paired um, activity with your loved one or family member, feel free to do that. Um, no phoning for friends, no lifelines here, um, but there's no wrong answer. We're all learning together. So in those cards decks, you'll see a yellow, red, blue, green, and yellow selection. And I'll have some questions posted, as you see on the screen here, that ask um, a question, and then we'll kind of put our cards up and see what the polling of the audiences, and then we can talk about it. And I can kind of walk you through what that answer is and what does that mean. And um, we can have some offline discussions later as well at the table. OK? Everyone's queued up with their index cards? OK, awesome. So the first question is, how long does it take to develop a new drug? OK. Looks like we have some blues in the middle. Combination on the left, on my left. We have a good rainbow of colors on this side. <laughs> Great, so um, 
The right answer is 10 years. Yeah, so let's give everyone in this room that's contributing, adding value, the Hypersomnia Foundation, the researchers here, the investigators, a round of applause right now that they're definitely committed to this field of research. Absolutely. You can't have commitment issues when you're committed to research. <laughs> okay, so next question. Get your deck of cards ready again. You can phone a, phone a neighbor beside you, but no phoning friends. Um, how much does it cost to develop a new drug? Okay, anyone else on that side? I see a good show. It's a good mix. There's no right or wrong answers. All right, so actually it could cost up to two billion. So I tricked you there. It's not even up there on the, on the selection. <laughs> two billion, yes. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit of that cost perspective and why it takes so long and why the investment is a significant investment for um, the academia, the industry partners, and also the advocacy groups to really support and have those discussions and to do the work, the groundwork, to drive research forward. Okay, so great, great visual here. And we're gonna talk about the phases of clinical trials. Um, we have a tendency in the space of research to throw a lot of lingo out, um, but not really take the time to digest and walk and break down what each phase means. Um, you may have seen some of these languages um, in brochures or pamphlets, but let's walk through these phases and talk about what do they mean. So phase one of the clinical research um, this study um, is testing the safety of the drug for the first time testing in humans. On some, for some oncology studies or other diseases, um, they may not be healthy volunteers as well, okay? Um, this is just basic information I just want to share with the team today and the group today. And then for studies, you, they're looking at the safety of the medication or the treatment of it. And let's take a look at the success rate and the number of participants. It takes 20 to 80 participants for a phase one study to get off the ground and get running and to recruit and get the patients and the data that we need to move to the next phase of research. And it could take up to several months and we'll talk about recruitment in just a minute. So keep in mind of this duration period um, column that's listed and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of those challenges there and how you can help. <laughs> okay, phase two. Um, determining whether a drug works in a broader population. So I think earlier today we talked about, you know, there are some drugs that are approved for narcolepsy, um, but nothing specific for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so you can see the value of what our team here and the advocacy groups are doing to really drive the research forward so that you can really have an FDA approved drug on the mar marketed drug. And phase two studies are looking at the efficiency of the drug. And that could be um, require a number of participants or individuals ranging from one to 300. And look at, the, it could take up to a number of years and that varies across diseases um, and the, the, the design of the research study or the trial. So let's look at phase three. That's confirming how well the drug is in a large patient population, patient, patient, large number of patients. And it could depend on the prevalence of the disease, but here, most importantly, it's looking at the safety, efficacy, and the dosing of the drug phase three trials. And look at that significant number of individuals that's needed to execute a drug um, phase three trial. Um, 1,000 to 3,000 individuals. So I'm gonna put a plug here right now, talk about the course registry, and you can see how it's important for us to make sure that we are continuously engaged um, when it comes to um, supporting the registry and to make sure that we are uh, letting our family members and friends know that we really need to be engaged and participate in order to drive the research forward um, so that we can have these clinical trials opportunities available. And then last phase is providing it in the real world, we call it. So that's looking at the long-term effectiveness of the drug and the cost effectiveness. And you can see that we need thousands of patients, of course, and you can look at that success rate of 70 to 90. So I just wanted to touch on that slide there just a bit. And even before we talk about, you know, phase one, two, three, and et cetera, you know, those natural history studies, those observational studies are significantly important for us to really gauge where we need to examine as a research team. Um, so, you know, 
clinical trials are great and they're phenomenal, but we really have to do the work early on um, to really get the, the, the ground and the basic information that we need um, for when we get to a drug development process. Okay, another polling question. <laughs> Keeping the group engaged. All right, so <laughs> how do you find out about clinical trials? There's no wrong answer here. Oh, someone's creative. I love it. <laughs> I see rainbows going up everywhere. Perfect. All right, so there's um, a group called CISGRIP, and they really do a good job on um, compiling data as far as patient perceptions and insights. And so I pulled out a piece of that data um, from that group, and you will not believe it, um, the numbers that they said, that it's, it's even, like 64% and 64% based on the group data and the way that they crunched the numbers. Digital communications and asking a healthcare provider. But then the, also in the digital communications, um, I have a feeling that advocacy groups and other channels of support and networks is included in that digital because, you know, we have online patient forums. Um, we have, you know, Snapchats, other ways that we connect uh, within the advocacy groups and other um, support entities in that way. And then the other sources are just a whole pile of other ways that you can find out about clinical trials. So I thought that was really, really important um, to really point out here today. So the next thing that I want to move on and talk about is informed consent. And this is so important when considering um, a clinical trial opportunity. And it is your duty and your right as an individual and as a caregiver or a support network to ask all the questions that you want before participating in a clinical trial. There's no right or wrong answers um, when it comes to right or wrong questions that you should ask, um, and that you should never feel uncomfortable or that you're bearing people down, times down um, to ask those questions. It is your duty and your right to ask those questions. So informed consent, what is it? It is a process which researchers use to communicate the potential um, participant or individual um, about the risk and the benefits of participating in a clinical trial. And uh, individual, um, or a patient, however you want to say that, would need to agree and sign an informed consent before um, participating in a clinical trial opportunity. And that informed consent process usually takes place um, at a study center site, which could be at a research center, um, and or at a hospital or academic healthcare institution. And you can choose to leave the study at any time, of course, that's your right. Um, and you can ask questions throughout the entire process of the informed consent, even before or after you sign the document. And one thing that is very important is, you know, when you're going through that informed consent process, um, companies like myself at Arcubia and other entities that support clinical research, we are very adamant about making sure that we are giving the sites the tools they need to discuss the study with you in the most um, compelling way and to make sure that the, um, it's, we're using mindful communication and not talking over your head with that language of the informed consent to really break down what the study is, what are you signing up for, what the potential benefits, risks are, and what is your commitment um, to that? And what does that look like for you for a long term? And the informed consent process, um, it is a document that's drafted up and it's outlining the overview of the study, um, the risk, the benefits, and that document cannot be shared with the patient unless it's reviewed by an ethics committee, like an institutional review board that we talked about earlier um, today. And that institutional review board looks at that document like a fine tooth cone to making sure that the information that is provided is not biased, it's not um, leaning towards one side to coerce an individual to participate in the trial. So we wanna make sure we lay out all the facts in an unbiased fashion. All right, I have another interactive question scenario. Just thinking about what I've talked about just a minute ago, we have two scenarios here, and we're gonna talk about which one is the best experience that a patient should have when they're going through an informed consent process. So the blue scenario reads, an informed consent document was provided to Mr. Smith. Dr. Brown reviewed the information with Mr. Smith and informed her that she could not change her mind about the participation in the clinical trial after she signs the consent document. The 
orange or red scenario, I apologize for that typo, um, is an informed consent document was provided to Ms. Smith. Dr. Brown reviewed the information with Ms. Smith and allowed her time to discuss the research study with her family members as well. It's a dead giveaway. <laughs> we know joining a clinical trial is not just a patient decision. It's a family decision. It's a commitment. It's time away from family. It's readjusting your schedule. Um, it's readjusting your work schedule, uh, making sure that you're educating your family members about where you're signing up and some things that you may need to navigate, you know, through that early, early process of the clinical trial and throughout. Um, we know that it's not just a patient decision. And, you know, the work that I do is to making sure that it's patient-centric, but it's also family-centric, that we're really making sure that the materials that we develop for the clinical trial considers the caregivers and the family members that are home with them every day and navigating this journey with them. So it's not just about the patient, but it's about the whole in support, the entire support network there. So the next list are a sample list of some questions that you can ask when you may have a clinical trial opportunity that you're exploring. And it could be you know, speaking with someone over the phone or sending an email to learn more about a clinical trial opportunity. Um, these are just a sample of questions that you know, individuals or family support networks may want to ask and it pertains to clinical trials. One point that I do want to bring out is, you know, how many visits. I know patient burden is a big challenge when it comes to clinical trials. And thinking about the phases of the clinical trials that we had on that little chart earlier and the duration of it, can you imagine the commitment, time away from work, um, time away from family? And there are also new and continuous processes to improve the patient burden, where we can do visits at home. We can submit diaries to track some of the information that we need for clinical trials. And it doesn't have to require continuous site visits to the clinic or study site. So ask those questions about exactly how many site visits, study site visits you would have to go to the clinic for. Um, is there any opportunity to do some in the convenience of your home or to do anything virtually from um, some type of electronic tablet or tool? Um, those are things that we're really trying to um, think about when it comes to um, patient advocacy, working with patient advocacy groups, and also from a patient-centric um, perspective as far as when we design studies and when we think about recruitment from a patient lens or a caregiver lens, what are just small things that would really be a decisionary factor if they really can commit to a trial? Are there any questions right now? Are, are we going to take questions now or later? She said if you, you have a phase four trial and it's a rare disease, of course with rare disease there may be a small number of patients affected by you, with that disease and living with it. How do you adjust for that? So one thing is we really rely on, with, in my experience with rare disease, I've worked in rare disease for almost over 10 years now, and in that it is very important when we rely on that, do another plug for them, courts registry. <laughs> <laughs> to really make sure that we are designing the study in the most adequate way. And it's, you know, I'll take a step back. One piece is getting the phase four, but also retaining the patients. And that's a challenge there where patients may sign up for a study and they may roll over to the next phase of the trial, but retaining them and making sure that whatever life happens and all the burdens there, how do we continuously engage? So companies like ourselves at IQV really develop strategies to engage patients and to find out where the patients are and also examine patients that are not diagnosed. So some of these trials early on um, for the design process, we look at patients that may be undiagnosed and working with sites and physicians to really ramp up that number. So when we get to phase four, maybe we can have more patients in that way. Um, the FDA and NIH is, account, is, is um, cognizant of those challenges, and there are um, certain regulations and policies with a little bit of flexibility for rare, for rare diseases where you don't have to meet that number quota to drive the research forward. So they are understanding of that as well. Hi. Hi. I'm interested in finding out about the long-term effects that might not be known at the time of the trial, especially when um, the trial might be taken by, the drug might be taken by a young adult who has not yet had children, that kind of thing. 
Absolutely. So how do you find out about the trial? How do you find out information about a trial, even once that phase is over or even the long-term effects? No, the long-term effects. So I'm a parent. I have a child who has not... Uh, she she might want children in the future. Mm-hmm. How do I know that this drug will not affect the reproductive rights of my child or some other you know some the other long term effects, effects that we don't drug. know about? Absolutely. So I'll take a step back and talk about. Um, drug safety and monitoring. Um, For the clinical trials that are um, in clinicaltrials.gov, that's a website that you can go to and type in a condition or any type of information. And it's an unbiased website where you can go in and look for clinical trial opportunities that may be aligned with the disease or condition um, that you're interested in participating in a trial for. For that, when we design trials, and one of the big pieces is data safety and monitoring and adverse events. Um, and following it over time. So even throughout all of the phases of trials of study, there's a designated team and committee that's making sure that the drugs as patients report adverse events, it could be big or small, they're being monitored and there's actually a separate committee that's looking at the long-term impacts and effectiveness of those drugs. And the FDA is very adamant about putting a hole on, on things when there may be more risk compared to benefits for a drug or trial. And also, if there's unanswered question that the research team, that could be sponsors or academia, can't answer, it is not a problem for a study to go on hold until those questions are answered. And those questions as far as childbearing, individuals of childbearing age taking drugs and what are the long-term effects are some questions that come up. Um, Just to give you another operational example and question is, when participating in a clinical trial, Um, and they give you a little card to say if you experience any adverse events or side effects uh, for for drug you're taking, be sure to report that because that data helps um, them to get a trigger if there's any patterns or trends in the data of what patients are reporting. That's very important. Um, And that information could help trials in the future and trials that are already in the pipeline that are enrolling right now. And if that information is collected and is flagged, then the internal teams of clinical research teams definitely take a step back and make sure that we're doing what's in the best interest of the patients and that the risk and the benefit analysis is balanced at all times. I hope that helps. <laughs> Great. I worked in pharmacovigilance a little bit too, so I'm, I'm really big on patient safety and adverse event um, reporting. I think that's a big thing to mention with clinical trials that you know you don't know if it's too big or too small to report, but just always communicate that with your site and your investigator. Um, Another point that I wanted to mention briefly was um, clinical trials that you may be interested in may not be with your designated provider and how you may be referred out to another physician to participate in a trial. That is a big barrier and challenge sometimes. And companies like myself at Acuvia and other researchers teams, we really develop a strategy to keep the primary physician in the loop and engaged and knowledgeable about what's going on with that patient or individual while they're in that clinical trial. So it's not a just just jointed process, but it's a continuously multidisciplinary team working towards the health and and, and treatment of the patients and individuals. Any more questions? Okay. I think the cards did it then. (laughs) Thank you.